Welcome to Sheboygan County Government, working for you. My name is Adam Payne, County Administrator and co-host of this program with Chairman Roger Distruti. That's right, Chairman Roger Distruti. I'm going to start by just acknowledging the fearless leader to my left, your right. Roger was just re-elected as County Board Chairman for his second consecutive term, second unanimous time that the County Board has selected him as Chair. Uh, Tom Wagner, our vice chair, but I'm looking forward to the term ahead and just wanted to say congratulations, Roger. Thank you, Adam. And as you know, we bring to you a monthly program about county programs, departments, and we're very pleased today to have one of our 19 department heads elected, Ellen Schleicher from the Register of Deeds. Welcome, Ellen. Thank you. Now, let me tell you, Ellen has a lot going on in her office, whether it's a new child being born in your family, whether you're purchasing a home or purchasing property. Uh, there are so many areas that the Register of Deeds is involved in, and I imagine many of you perhaps have had the opportunity to meet Ellen or her staff, but they do a great job. And if you haven't, today you're gonna to learn a little bit more about their roles and responsibilities. So Ellen, please begin by just sharing a little bit about yourself. When did you start as our Register of Deeds? I started as Register of Deeds in January of 2006. I uh, was appointed by Governor Doyle when the pre my predecessor uh, resigned uh, her position. Um, <clears throat> had a lot to learn and uh, enjoy learning, so it was a, a good experience for me to you know, grow a little bit more personally and socially. Um, and you're from the area. I am from Sheboygan. Grew up in town of Sheboygan, actually, right where St. Nicholas Hospital is, uh, right short, not too far away from there, just about a half a block down the road, uh, is now the surgical center. So um, where my parents lived for 30, 40 years, um, and then now live in the town of Lima. Very nice, country living. Country living. Mm -hmm. um, my husband and I, my husband, I should say, is his hobby. Uh, farms about 100, we own about 140 acres and um, he cash crops and we raise hogs. Yeah. I only fill in once in a while, but <laughs> yeah. for the most part, him and, him and my son Very are in nice. partnership with that. That so. sounds like a pr pretty extensive hobby farm, 146 yeah, acres. Yep. Yeah, impressive. And I recall you sharing with me in the past, you used to work for the Kohler Company. I worked for Kohler Company for 30 years um, in various, various uh, off uh, buildings, almost every building. The only department or building that I did not work in was the pottery. Um, I worked at the American Club when it was the Amer or prior to it being the Five Star Hotel, um, the foundry, the enamel shop, generator, engine, brass, um, and not the warehouse, but the, um, farming to leading an office. Right. And an office that, again, does a lot of very important re recording work and uh, has documents that people need or transactions that are necessary to purchase a home or mortgage, purchase land. Um, tell us a little bit about your office. What are the roles and responsibilities of the Register of Deeds? Well, our office actually deals in the land records. Um, that is our, you know, most our main purpose. It doesn't matter if a home is on it. It is the legal description of the land records. Um, so I'm going to use this as an example. Um, Hurricane Sir Sandy went through and just tore up the, the eastern coast. The houses were gone. There's nothing there. There's not a physical thing there. But the description of the legal description of that plot is in our office recorded in our office and that is how when you're rebuilding you can find you know what where your lot lines are um, that it's it's recorded there whatever the house on it or the buildings on it isn't really uh, necessary in our office it is actually the legal the physical land physical description Does that make, of the I mean property. I think that I think that best describes it I think that's an excellent example um, obviously we hope we never have a hurricane here, but Correct. you could have a tornado, tornado or some natural disaster where if everything's wiped out, just where are the property lines? Mm -hmm. And even if there are buildings there or fences there, people still want that certified survey and recorded mm -hmm. document just right. to make sure they know exactly where their lot line is or where they can put up the fence. Correct. I mean, for lot lines and stuff like that, um, in the cities, there are the subdivisions set up where there's each lot, it's a lot, you know, 
uh, and, and it shows your lot lines. In the county, you know, more of the rural areas, you don't have that set lot, you know, everything's not square. I right. mean, you have your quarter quarters and, and you know, and your, but they're not square. It's not, you know, you can have land cut out from different areas and change by roads. And so then back to the role of your office, you, what do you and your staff do? What's your primary responsibility? Our primary, well, okay, so the, the land is, is called, you get a deed, mm -hmm. it's a warranty deed, quit claim deed, um, transfer, you know, tra transfer by affidavits, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so you get a deed, and on that deed is a legal description of the lot. The deed and the mortgages, so when you buy property or, you know, your mortgage is also recorded. Usually they're recorded together. You have the deed and then the mortgage. Um, when you pay that mortgage off, the satisfaction is recorded, and that shows uh, land, you know, the, tr the title, the title insurance mm -hmm. or the title of the land. Mm -hmm. It goes back to 1848, you know, that, so when you're ever, wherever it was plotted or surveyed or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. we have records that are dating back to 1848, uh, the land records. Um, and so you can follow your property back to who owned it prior, you know, to you and prior to them and prior to them. If you lose any of those documents or you misplace them or you have a fire, you can come to our office and, and, and get those copies from our office. Um, we do have to charge for them, but um, they are read, readily available for the most part. And so you always know where you can go to get your, to get your uh, documents. So the land records or documents are all recorded at your office, and, mm -hmm. and certainly you can go back and look for that. But what about going forward? If Roger sells me a piece of property, Am I required then to have that recorded in your office? If you want to lay claim to it, okay. you know, what is in our office is whoever was the last owner, whoever now uh, has interest in that property. And as long as Roger pays his taxes, he's, you know, the taxes on there, he could sell it to you. He can say, oh, Roger, you know, I'll give you a hundred bucks for that land. And Roger goes, okay, mm -hmm. but Roger's still paying the taxes on it. If you don't record it, Nobody knows that you gave him that hundred dollars for that land. Okay. You know, so. So it's really the, the final important piece of the process to make sure people absolutely. recognize you are now the new it's owner. It's to show the ownership. Yep. How many people work in the Register of Deeds office? Um, there are seven of us. And you have a budget of. Uh, roughly seven hundred thousand dollars. It's about six hundred and ninety-three. And if you just saw Ellen smile just a little bit when she said that. Ellen can smile because she is the only department of our 19 departments that doesn't rely on any property tax levy. And that makes all of us smile, doesn't it, Roger? <laughs> That's for sure. I wish more of our departments didn't have to rely on property tax levy because in most in instances, they, they utilize property tax levy, state or federal fees, what have you. But Ellen does not. In fact, it's one of the few departments that actually contributes a little bit to our bottom line. So how is it that you support your staff and your operation? How does that work? Well, our office is, um, everything in our office is done per state statutes. So, you know, we don't have any much leeway on how we can charge or not charge. Um, so per state statutes, uh, recording a, a document in our office is $30 for mm -hmm. every document. Um, anything except for plats, which are the $50. Um, the birth, death, and marriage records are $20 a piece and $3 for any additional copies. We charge four copies if anybody, if you need to come into our office to re, uh, request a copy. It's $2 for the first page and a dollar for any additional. So a deed typically will cost you $2 unless, you, except for the older ones, it'll be $3. Most of the time they're, they're you know, uh, just one, one page, so it's $2. For a mortgage, however, um, those can vary from anywhere from $2 to 24 depending. I mean, some mortgages um, are two pages, three pages, some are 20, 25 pages, depending upon the lender, how they write it up, so. And that's a nice transition to an addition to the land records. You said there's marriage licenses and other documents as well that are recorded and safeguarded in your office. They're filed. Certified surveyed copies are, are, can be got out of our office for birth, birth, marriage, and death. 
Um, we have them safeguarded in our vault. Mm -hmm. And um, when someone comes in and requests a copy, then we get it out, put it on certified paper, and uh, issue that copy. So last question before I turn it over to Roger. If you can, just walk our viewers through, I know you can, if you will, please walk our, our viewers through, what are the steps involved with processing a, a deed? Okay. If, if someone comes in, what happens then? I'd be happy to answer that for you. Um, when they come in to process, to record a deed, <coughs> generally it's they walk up to the counter or they can mail them in. Um, they put a number on it because we have a numbering system in our, in our um, office and it gets put down in a basket and we pick it up uh, by number and you know we, we do the recording and we record it, we scan it, we index it, um, then, then we check it over, uh, recheck it to make sure all the legals and everything is good on it and then we return it back. We mail it, generally mail it back or if it's uh, one of our normal customers that come into the office, the title companies or whatever, we have a place where we set them and they can pick them up when they're complete. They put you know, $30 on it or we have escrow accounts that, that we can draw out of. And um, when you say you record it, you know, that's what I was looking for you to uh, define a little bit. That, that's where you scan in the document and kind of certify that this is an appropriate official document. Right. We have our, our land record or the software is, is a index kind of a thing, but we put all the information in the grantor grantee, scan it, scan the document into the system, into the computer, and then um, it goes into a processing where, we, you know, we do uh, heavier, we put down what kind of document it is, um, what, the, what the amount of the mortgage is or, or whatever verify the, the legal description in the computer, and then it gets, it gets posted, but it puts a time stamp on it. And you know, I mean, you'll hear a lot of, info, a lot of times, and you know what I'm talking about, uh, the, the race to the courthouse, you know, um, and some folks don't really, you know, they probably don't realize this, but if someone is purchasing something or borrowing money, um, and they wanna try and get this recorded before somebody puts a lien on them. You know, it's called the race to the courthouse. Who's gonna, who's gonna lay claim to that property before it's recorded? Hmm. Some title companies are very, very uh, adamant about how that is done. Uh, it, can, it can cause problems with mortgages, stuff like that, if, if one mortgage is recorded before the other. Hmm. So it puts a time stamp on it and says, okay, at 2.30, you know, whatever date, April 17th, this document was recorded. So as of 2.30 of this, that date, you now own the property or you now own a mortgage that you have to pay off. Gotcha, gotcha. And of course the numbering system is to make sure you're treating everyone fairly and consistently Correct. and as it's received, it's processed. Correct. Yeah. Very good, thank you, Ellen. Roger. Thank you, Adam, and uh, thank you, Ellen, for the great job you and your staff do for Sheboygan County. And uh, we've just talked about uh, quite a bit of the um, uh, talk about the mortgages and conveying uh, ownership. Let's talk a little bit about um, the other services that the Register of Deeds had, like uh, in particular, how does a person obtain a birth certificate or other vital records? Okay, um, again, that is also run by the State Vital Records Office. We have forms in our office, available in our office for each respective request. Um, we also have them available online on our website that they can fill out. They fill the top out is their information and then the birth information. We do require that they have valid IDs. So check to make sure that, and that is to help against property for, or for, not property fraud, but identity theft. Um, there is certain people that can only, there's only certain people that can get a birth record or death or marriage, you have to have tangible interest. Um, so we make sure that that's all taken care of mm -hmm. and, or that it's all kosher and, and uh, they hand us their, their form and we look it up, we run, run a cert, make a certified copy and uh, give it back to them and charge them $20. <laughs> And why would someone need a certified birth certificate? You know, years ago you didn't need them as much as what you do now, but for now they need them for school, for sports, 
um, they need them to get their driver's license. If you're under, six, under 18, you need to have your birth certificate for a work permit. Some jobs, when you get employed, to be employed, you have to have a birth certificate to verify your age. Um, companies that change insurance companies, uh, they, the insurance companies require a birth certificate. In the case of a death certificate or an heir to establish heirs, you may need a death certificate of your parents or whatever, and then you need birth certificates of any of the heirs for the insurance purposes. So it is a very, very, very important document. You almost need it for almost anything you do now to get a passport, to travel, anything. You, you, you need a birth certificate to verify that. And I know a lot of people are um, often interested in researching their family tree. Uh, how can your office help with that? We, have, we allow genealogists in our office. Um, we have a, a small area for them to work in. Um, it is in our vital vault. And uh, they now come in and they fill out a form and they verify, you know, we, we, take, we verify their identity. And once a year they fill this form out, we keep it on record. And then they can come in and just sign in instead of having to fill out a form every time. We just do it one, make them do it once a year. So we have all their information on there in case there's any questions on uh, anybody. If you know, some people don't want other people looking up their stuff. So, but everything is all under you know. It's, we we kind of keep an eye on it. Um, they are free to look at any most of the re any records from 1848 to 1907. And after that, they can look at some of the records if they don't have confidential information on them. If they have confidential information on them, we will um, assist them with what they need to go, what they need to find. Mm -hmm. um, they usually are looking for uh, spouses' names, and, you know, like with parents, who the father was, who the mother was. Uh, there's information on there that just amazes me by, you know, what they can find on a birth, death, or marriage record. Interesting. You taught me something new there. Yeah, because I wasn't aware of that either. I always thought that everything in Register of Deeds was a public record, but there are some documents that are... The vital records are uh, protected under the state statutes. Prior to 1907, there was no um, real... Uh, how can I say that? It's, there wasn't a real standard on it. Mm -hmm. um, and you'll find back, it, it actually is rather interesting. But from 1848 to 1907, um, it wasn't a requirement to uh, record those documents or re register those documents. So you see sometimes when people would come in, and you can see it in the index, you know, they'll, they'll, like, they'll come in in like 1897 or whatever, and they're registering 10 names. You know, someone came into the county seat and, um, registered all their kids at one time. But from 1907 forward, uh, those records are protected. Um, and especially uh, birth, uh, <clears throat> unmarried births uh, are confidential. No one can see them except for the, the birth mother or the child. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, what types of information can be found on the Sheboygan County website? Oh, now we've got to list all this. Well, we have our picture on there. That's really nice. Um, we have our office hours. We have, um, and I'm doing this by memory, so we have uh, um, different places you can go to. We have information on land records. We have information on how to get to a vital record. We have information on, um, um, I'm losing it now. A lot of information, but they should really check it out and look for themselves. They should really. It's <laughs> www.sheboygancounty.com, and just look for re under departments for register of deeds. But there is a lot of information on there. Um, it does have our contact information. We try and help folks as much as we can to get their information, fill out their fill out the forms and stuff, and then bring them into the office. It's a lot easier um, for them there. But generally, like you know, I like to say. Within five ten minutes, they can get their birth, death, or marriage certificates. If you know, if there's no problem, so. And I also understand that you have remote uh, access. You can provide that. Uh, how is that? Uh, how does that work? And how, okay. what's involved? Um, 
generally we have you know we have title companies that that come into the office and uh, they look up on our public computers at what information they're looking for a lot of times they don't want to take the time to come into our office so we offer uh, remote access it's called it's our, our software company it's uh, called Laredo it is an online system that they can contract for they sign a contract and they pay a certain amount of dollars per what minutes they think they are going to use we have a sliding scale that goes from 150 minutes to uh, unlimited and the dollars is like 50 to 400 dollars split out like six different they have six different options and along with that, instead of paying the $2 and $1 per copy, they pay $0.35 cents a co per copy. Um, so they contract for that, and then we, we bill them monthly for what they, whatever they use. Uh, we have some folks that, that take the 150 and find out minutes a month and find out that they used it in two days. So then they up it. Uh, we also have a, a service, another online service that uh, for maybe just the person who's just looking up their property or looking up a property that they may be interested in and that's called tapestry and that is a 595 they pay per search and they can print out their documents for 50 cents a page um, and we do have users that use that also they're not ready to go into the the Laredo so it's another option for someone who's not quite ready to go make that jump Thank you, Ellen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very interesting. And, and back to the area that uh, I'd like to learn more from, from you. One of the great things about being in county government is that 19 departments, 200 and some programs and services, you're always learning something mm -hmm. and you always have an opportunity to improve upon things. And Ellen's made a lot of wonderful improvements in, in the Register of Deeds. And uh, you touched on something earlier I wanted to come back to because I haven't you know, I haven't gone to your office to get a birth certificate for myself. Maybe my, my wife perhaps has used it before, but I per personally haven't. I can go to the county treasurer's office and run off anyone's tax bill information. That's public information. I can go to your office and can I request a property deed for anyone? Yes, yes. you can. That is public, that is public record. And that's what I thought. But if I go to your office and I want Roger's birth certificate, that I can't get. No, you cannot. If I want my birth certificate, what do I need to show you to prove that I'm, it's okay to share that with me? We would need to see a valid pictured ID. Mm -hmm. um, or if you don't have that, um, there are other entities. We can take a passport. US, uh, we can take a bill. Uh, but it has to be two bills with your address on that are showing your name and address on there. Okay. We are now able to, now the state has allowed us that if someone has a checking account or their bank statement on their smartphones, we can accept that as an ID, hmm. which just came, they just gave us permission to do that. Now let's say I go to your office, I want Roger's birth certificate, but I have Roger's ID and address information. Do you look like Roger? I would have to look like him, yes. wouldn't I? Mm -hmm. So unless I was a twin, you would mm -hmm. turn me away. We would. What are other examples of documents that you can provide because it's a public record and can't provide because? Well, any do, anything to do with land records, um, yeah. uh, deeds, mortgages, trade names, contracts, um, subdivisions, certified survey maps, any of that is, is, is readily available for the right. public. It's just mostly the vital records. Vital records. Are... Very good. Nice distinction. And again, if you're interested in learning more about this or have an interest in your, your history or family tree, and I know my dad is really into this, and I, get a, I really give people credit who take the time to, to drill down into that. It's fascinating. Uh, Register of Deeds, wonderful resource, and I know I see some of the same faces go to your mm -hmm. office, uh, I don't know, week in and week out or month or from time to time just to drill into that. Just one big happy family in our <laughs> office. <laughs> and if you want copies of information uh, or you're recording a document, as you shared earlier, Ellen, uh, there are fees associated with that, and these are state uh, required fees from a standpoint of how much you can charge for that service, and it's to re our time and our investment to, to cover our costs, essentially. 
Right, and also, well, it's, yeah, they're state mandated, but we also, the state gets quite a few of those dollars that they are requiring, so let's, we should make that straight. We yes. don't get all of that money in our office. Why doesn't would that be, surprise me? Would be really, <laughs> <laughs> would be really nice, um, yeah. but there are, uh, the state gets like uh, $15 out of every recorded document. Um, every, their vital records, they get uh, $12 out of the birth certificates, and eight dollars out of the death and marriage so um, yep we're, we don't get to keep all that money for ourselves and some of our viewers might be thinking well why do more departments do that you know why why am I paying all this in property taxes if in fact the people that are actually using the service or benefiting from the service in your case in your department are paying for the service mm -hmm. uh, probably one of the other examples in the county would be the clerk of courts office where people are paying fines and forfeitures but there, back to Ellen's point, the state takes so much of the money that the county collects that we still need to subsidize the clerk of court's office with property tax levy because we can't keep enough of what we retain. Always opportunities for improvement. Mm -hmm. But uh, Ellen can smile because her office doesn't have to rely on that tax levy and that's just fantastic. Well, I wanna thank you so much for joining us today and I wanna thank you, Ellen, for just an thank excellent overview. Uh, Ellen has a wonderful team. If you've been in that office before, you know what a friendly group they are, how courteous they are, and, and I really think they do a tremendous job and reflect so well on thank Sheboygan you. County. So again, thank you, Ellen. If you have more questions or want to share any suggestions or opportunities for improvement, don't hesitate to contact Ellen or myself or Roger Destruti. And that's really one of the big reasons we have this program. I think it's been almost a dozen years now that every month we've been showcasing a different department and talking about their roles and responsibilities. And, um, you know, I think people follow this program, Roger. You know, we, we've heard that people find it interesting. And, and I do think there's a lot of good work and interesting things done here. But if you ever have a suggestion for improvement or you know, something we want, we should consider doing differently. Don't ever hesitate to contact the department head or contact your elected county board supervisor or myself, and we'd be happy to hear your thoughts on that. Next month, we're going to have our director of transportation here, Greg Schnell, and a new face for you. His name's Charles Sweet. He is our new airport superintendent, just started about six weeks ago. So until next month, thanks for joining us.